Hello and thanks for joining us here on France 24 for this special edition of France In Focus, dedicated entirely to the legacy of Napoleon Bonaparte. This against the backdrop of the 200th anniversary of the Battle of Waterloo, when the French Imperial Army under the leadership of Napoleon confronted the British and Allied forces in a battle which historians generally agree shaped the future of France and resulted in a century of peace across Europe. Well, in this special edition, we'll ask what happened on that day 200 years ago. We'll also ask why it is that some French people still think that France won at Waterloo. We'll also examine why it is that the legacy of Napoleon lives on so many years after his death. Well, this programme comes to you from Les Invalides in central Paris, the burial site of a number of key figures in French military history, amongst them Corsican-born Napoleon himself. Well, his fate was sealed during the Battle of Waterloo in the year 1815, when Britain's Duke of Wellington and his Prussian allies defeated the French forces. Well, let's take a closer look now and see just what happened during that decisive battle two centuries ago. Shot, shell and cavalry charge. It was June 18th, 1815, and the armies of a British coalition and France had taken to the field of battle at Waterloo, Napoleon Bonaparte's most ignominious defeat. The French emperor fielded an army of some 70,000 against the Duke of Wellington's similar numbers. Napoleon a Napoleon had a great plan. On paper, everything pointed towards a huge victory. But from the moment it went into action, everything started to come apart at the seams. Firstly, the French soldiers were exhausted after spending a night in the pouring rain. What's more, Napoleon was so sure of his victory, he'd failed to scout the terrain. The English troops were entirely hidden from view. Napoleon didn't know where the enemy troops were. It was really typical of Wellington. He always hid his troops. Around 140,000 soldiers faced off in fields that have changed little to this day. By evening, more than 10,000 lay dead. The next French arrow was in repeatedly trying to take this farmhouse in the center of the battlefield. The British would push the French back each time as they fell before the enemy guns. They'd get here, see the building and be fired on. It was carnage, a slaughter. The French soldiers fell in their hundreds. The final blow came in the late afternoon. The Prussian army fell on unsuspecting French forces and the battle was lost. The emperor's rule was done and France's destiny forever altered. Waterloo was the end of the great Franco-British struggle, which had gone on for several centuries. It ended in a British victory, and Britain would become, in the 19th century, probably the greatest power the world had ever seen. 200 years later, the fields of Waterloo are again in focus, as France commemorates one of the most fateful days in its history. Well, who better to tell us more about Napoleon and that battle than Stephen Clark, the British author, who wrote this book, How the French Won Waterloo or Think They Did. Uh, Stephen, the title of this book implies that you seem to think the French are in denial about what happened there at Waterloo. Uh, some French people certainly are. I wrote it because I, I started reading about the battle and I found all these French historians, perfectly serious French historians, who were giving the most amazing excuses why Napoleon might have lost. And some were even saying that he'd actually won, that he'd won a sort of moral victory by being a tragic hero, or that his troops, by standing up until the last minute, the guard, Imperial Guard standing up to the last minute with one of the generals saying, merde to the English, that was the victory. And historians seem to be carrying on even now, implying that Napoleon was in no way a loser. How do you explain the fact that a thousand or more films have been made about this small man in stature, and yet what a great figure of history. Well, yes, yeah, I mean, you mustn't forget that at the time, France really was ruling Europe thanks to him. When we think about history now, and when we try to imagine a few historical figures, Napoleon is the one who leaps to our imagination. His black hat, his long coat, you know, the hand inside the waistcoat, he cr deliberately created a memorable image. He was great at branding. He could get a job now for Google or anybody. He used to give away his hair 
as presents, like, you know, relics to people while he was still alive. Um, he created this huge, you know, self-important brand that, are, that has carried on through the centuries. You know, we've, for two centuries now, he's still one of the most famous icons of history. If you go to the, the Waterloo battle site now, they've got a huge new museum. In the souvenir shop, the little statuettes that got sold are the ones of Napoleon. No one really knows much what Wellington looked like, uh, Blue Show, we have no idea. It's, it's Napoleon who stayed in the public imagination, but it's mainly thanks to his own image creation. He's a divisive figure, obviously, uh, always has been. But still in the world of French politics, you look at the political left, the book that came out by uh, Lionel Jospin, uh, vilifying Napoleon. You look at the political right, uh, Dominique de Villepin uh, very much considers Napoleon to be a hero figure. Why this uh, difference of opinion? Well, w whether you're left or right in France, in politics, they're still obsessed with Napoleon. Um, apparently, Manuel Valls, the, um, the prime minister, is a big fan of Napoleon, or if not a fan of his politics, at least a fan of him as a political figure. I mean, and you have to say, when you see practically every French president, I mean, they're all in the Palais de l'Elysée, a Napoleonic palace, surrounded by his furniture. Deep down, I honestly think that left or right, every French politician has Napoleon in his, in his mind when he's, when he's going into politics. You know, this was the great man of European politics of his time. Plus, he was a hugely courageous battle leader. You know, for, the French, for French politicians, left or right, he's, he's an icon. Love him or loathe him, there's little disagreement over the fact that Napoleon's influence over France and the rest of Europe was extraordinary. Well, his influence can still be seen all over the place with the vast monuments that he commissioned. But as we're about to see in this next report, his influence can also be felt in a number of French institutions to this very day. He ruled France for only 16 years, but the first consul turned emperor has left an indelible imprint on the country that is still clear today, particularly in the field of law. In 1804, Napoleon inaugurated the Civil Code, still popularly known as the Napoleonic Code. Almost half of its 2,500 articles remain in their original version to this day, and they form the backbone of France's civil law. Napoleon also created the Senate, the Council of State, the Bank of France, the Exchequer, and France's commercial law and labour courts. These are the masses of granite, and it was he that called them that, because he intended them to be institutions that would last. When he created the Legion of Honour in 1802, Napoleon said that men follow trinkets. So behind Napoleon's ideas, there was always the desire to control, to order the regime, both on the administrative and architectural level, but also in the domain of everyday life. Napoleon also laid the foundations of France's secular laws with the Concordat of 1801. Catholicism had recovered after the revolution, but it would no longer be a state religion and would have to coexist with other faiths. He also organized the churches in a very precise fashion, not only the Catholic Church after the Concordat, but also the Protestant ones and Jewish institutions too. Napoleon, if you will, was relatively indifferent with regard to religion, so he was very tolerant in this respect. Napoleon's most visible traces can be found in the big cities of Europe, particularly in his capital, Paris. You see the Napoleonic presence in Paris in the architecture itself. From the obelisk at Place de la Concorde, you see four Napoleonic creations. To the north, the Church of La Madeleine. To the west, the Arc de Triomphe. To the south, the National Assembly. And to the east, the Arc du Carousel. The obelisk, too, is a Napoleonic legacy, a vestige of his Egyptian campaign in 1798. Next time you happen to be at Paris's Place de la Concorde, Bear in mind more than two centuries of history, which it embodies.
Napoleon died in the year 1821 at the age of just 51. And four decades after his death, his remains were entombed here under the dome of Les Invalides in Paris. Well, after Waterloo, he was kept in British custody on the remote southern Atlantic island of St. Helena, where his living conditions were far from luxurious. He died six years after his arrival. Napoleon trapped in Longwood for more than five years. The deposed emperor arrived on the island of St. Helena in 1815. Isolated some 8,000 kilometers away from Paris, it was impossible for him to escape. This is where Napoleon passed away. Now, this house has become a tourist attraction. Visitors like Pascal retrace Napoleon's life in exile. This hole in the blind allowed Napoleon to spy on the guards outside. This symbolizes his exile in St. Helena. Practically nobody could see Napoleon. But he could watch the British soldiers in Longwood. Napoleon's room was only 20 square meters. His worst enemy here was boredom. Britain had to, you know, protect you know, protect him, I suppose, from a possible escape from his various supporters. But I think it's sad, really, that such a great man should, you know, should end his days here. Some 6,000 people visit the house every year. France acquired the domain in 1857. In the Geranium Valley, Napoleon's tomb is empty. His remains were brought back to France in 1840. Well, he used to uh, come by here on horseback every evening. Yeah. And he, he did like the, this place because it was peaceful. Yeah. And that's why he chose this place. Napoleon was held prisoner on this tiny island off the coast of Africa for nearly 2,000 days, guarded by British soldiers day in and day out. Well, that's all we have time for for this special edition of France in Focus. We leave you here in this room at the Musée de l'Armée, the French military museum at the Invalide in central Paris. Uh, just behind me, a portrait there of Napoleon on the day of his coronation. Thank you very much indeed for watching. See you again soon here on France 24.